I think one of the ways in which you can really drive you know, a, a serious uptick in engagement, particularly with our kind of product, is making it a lot more personalized. Um, so the way in which we intend on doing that is... Before we dive in, please consider liking this video and hitting that subscribe button so you can get more of these conversations. And while you're at it, head over to theopenletter.io to sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter. Enjoy the show. Welcome everyone to How Would You Build It? It's episode 22, which is pretty close to what the Springbok score was against the Aussies this weekend. Renier, did you watch? Yeah, almost 22 tries. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, well, it's nice, nice to give them a little hammering, but the big game obviously coming up on the weekend. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, welcome. It's good to have you back. And I uh, just had to bring up the rugby because uh, Chris, our guest for today, is sitting in London today. Chris, mm -hmm. thanks for joining from Strove. How yeah. are you doing? Thanks for having me, guys. I'm all good. And yourself? Yeah, yeah. No, we're good and we're excited because we're going to talk about Strove and we're talking sports, wellness, and uh, yeah, what Strove has been able to do. And so we gave you a bit of a, a heads up, but Chris, can you just quickly give us your elevator pitch for Strove so everyone can understand what you guys do. Sure. So essentially uh, what we've built at Strove is an employee wellbeing platform and it's really focused on like helping companies improve their employees' physical and mental health. Um, so you know, we've got a mobile application and a web application. So once a company becomes a client of ours, the employees get access to our, our platform. And really what we're trying to do is we provide employees with sort of incentives and uh, we're trying to like motivate them to be more physically active and take care of their physical health. Um, and then on, on the other side, we sort of provide them with a suite of um, tools and features focused on their mental health. And really, just, uh, we're trying to provide like a comprehensive solution for uh, employee well-being. Um, mm. Essentially doing so in a modern, modern and engaging way, though, because mm. a lot of um, products and services in our space, uh, engagement is a challenge. So really what we're trying to do is outside of addressing both an employee's physical and mental health needs, also do so in an engaging and sort of modern way. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. So I was lucky enough to be exposed to it uh, while I was working at the Delta and it was quite cool. <laughs> and, and the more people that were involved, the more people that were active, the more engaged it actually got mm -hmm. those leaderboards and stuff. So you like creating this community because everyone can go on Strava, right? And you can see you're competing and it's well, not competing, but you're seeing people that you might not really know intimately. But when you go into your daily meetups, uh, or your stand-ups at work and you start talking about the leaderboard and it's like drives people to say, well, no, mm -hmm. I have to go for a run now because I can't have you beat me this week. It's a great, it's a great concept. Yeah. I think, so yeah. yeah. No, I was just going to say, so there's like this, what we sort of built into the product and we'll continue building into the product and iterating on going forward is like the social accountability piece. So we've got like physical and mental health, but then like almost equally as important is this um, social aspect in, um, that we built into the platform. So like, Currently, we've just got sort of fairly standard leaderboards, but like what we're about to release is a groups feature. So like employees can invite each other into groups and there's like uh, activity feeds within those groups. Nice. Um, we're going to start working on a social feed. So actually it's going to look quite similar to Strava to some extent. Um, so really it's just this like, like I said, sort of the social accountability piece. So you don't feel like you sort of operating and using this platform in a silo. Um, mm. And social accountability, it really does drive like proper behavior change that's ultimately what we're trying to achieve so that's exactly what i was going to say that was the, where i was going to move the conversation towards like the main thing about doing this is creating good habits right and being mm -hmm. able to get people to do the behaviors and and if i'm not mistaken this was a also a covid startup right it was you were before or during that you started stroke uh it was about six or seven months into covid so it was like around november december 2020 I think we launched the, we launched the first version of our app like first of Feb twenty twenty one, yeah. So kind of not right at the beginning of COVID, but um, shortly after, sort of everything was, you know, becoming a bit of a mess. Um, so <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you know, we, we built a company like fully remote, um, mm. and yeah, it was an interesting experience. But I think like. COVID also was a bit of a, it did create a bit of a tailwind, at least for us in the sense that companies um, started to realize sort of the importance of making sure that they were taking care of their employees' mm. health. Um, yeah. So particularly in South Africa, it's like quite an underdeveloped, but employee wellbeing landscape is quite an underdeveloped space. So uh, we definitely were in a, like a good position to um, build a product that sort of um, HR teams were 
more actively starting to look for, mm. particularly in South Africa. Okay. I mean, there's been quite a trend. Eh? I mean, we've had Oli Health uh, CEO also mm-hmm. on, on our show, mm-hmm. like kind of talking about it. It's, Renia, there was that, that trend in 2020. What do you think are the challenges now with these kind of, with the Stroves and the Oli Healths, you know, outside of COVID? I mean, do you, do you think that this trend will continue and, and the Stroves will be able to thrive? No, I believe there's definitely a space for it. And like Chris mentioned, you know, some of the, the employee wellness things out there is quite outdated, right? And, um, you know, unfortunately, traditionally, you know, these typically corporates look at these things as just a box to tick, right? They just throw <laughs> it in a package and go, come work for us. You get all of these things. And, yeah. and then when you actually day one, try and plug in and figure out what's going on and how do I get this benefit of going to a gym, you know, there's some red tape or no one really uses it. And, uh, and then the actual benefit of it is, is much less than you originally anticipated. And, mm-hmm. and much worse, actually, the company doesn't actually end up getting the benefit of an employee that is healthy and participating and leaning into the things that the company put forward. So, so I think the use of technology in this space to try and drive that um, is, is, is definitely the way to go. But something I've been wondering about, Chris, is, is like, you know, where does, the, where does a company draw the line, right? So, you know, a lot of modern employees say, you know, I don't want the company to do my retirement or my, my <laughs> medical aid. You know, it's my stuff. It's my decisions. I want to do the stuff that I want to do. But on the other hand, we all know that employees that are healthy and fit, you know, they contribute better at work, right? That's, <laughs> and, and I've got no data to back that up. I'm making assumptions, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's a good assumption to make. Um, so healthy employees are better, but but is it the company's responsibility to play in that space? Like, how, how, do, how do you see that? Uh, I wouldn't say this is, well, I guess you could see it as a responsibility to some extent. Uh, if you are a company that is trying to be competitive in the market, which is pretty much every private company, I mean, you wouldn't build a business unless you were trying to, you know, make money to some extent. Um, you're going to want to have employees that are healthy because they are naturally i mean there's plenty of data to back back these statements up you know healthy employees they are more productive they are sick less they take less you know leave because of the the fact that they were sick so um it's almost it is your your responsibility to some extent to make sure that you're at least making an effort to to some extent to take your to take care of your employees um both physical and mental well-being. Um, I think, and companies are realizing this more and more. I think COVID was like the the catalyst for a lot of companies to really start taking it seriously. And I don't think it's a, a trend that will die off anytime soon, particularly as um, you know we start op- we you know we continue to operate in a more competitive environment going forward. We will continue to operate in a more competitive environment going forward. So you're going to want to make sure that you're taking care of your, care of your employees from a physical and mental health perspective. I think equally as important, um, if you, it's it's fairly, it would be fairly easy for an employee to pick up whether you have a culture of health and well-being internally, or if you're just ticking a box with the solutions that you're offering and the strategy, the people strategy from a well-being perspective that you've employed. Mm. Um, so. You can look at it as you obviously want to have a healthy employee base, but then you want to be able to recruit people as well. So if you're trying to attack ta- attract talent to your company, um, and let's say a talented employee has an has the option of choosing between two different companies, one, um, you know, has this culture of health and well-being internally, and it's very visible to someone external to the company that they do actually care about health and well-being. The other, the company perceives that. And then it's just like, you know, having it, you know, using health and well-being sort of just a, just a tick box exercise for them. Um, which company are you going to go to as an employee? Mm. So I think, you know, there's a the productivity piece and absenteeism piece, which we will talk about. But then I think also equally as important as the recruitment piece. Mm. And if you want to be competitive, you need to make sure that you're also recruiting mm. the best talent. So I don't yeah. think, and, I, I don't think and, this trend is going to disappear like anytime soon. And Chris, do you also see that it creates a bit of a vibe that actually makes people pull in their mates to come and work in a place? Because I can imagine, right? It kind of gets competitive and we all, this gamified environment and we're all running and we're mm. doing fun things together. And so now we're not only working together, but we might end up doing some fitness, social things outside of work. Mm-hmm. Um, do, do you see that playing a role as well? Uh, definitely. Um, I think particularly, it's definitely more important now. We talk about like that 
there's a social accountability piece, but then there's also creating like a social element within a company and bringing people together. I think particularly in a world where a lot of companies are either operating like fully remotely or in this like hybrid environment, I think creating space for employees to connect and get together outside of work, uh, if we could be an enabler of that as a platform, I think it's quite a, a, an attractive value proposition or at least part of our value mm-hmm. proposition. So. Yeah. And, and I'm curious about like, it sounds fantastic. I mean, I've been part of it, so I don't want to just be a, a salesperson for you guys. But how do you go about <laughs> validating this for for companies? Right, they hear about it, they're like, "Yeah, it sounds okay." Like, can you tell us about like maybe you have a story where you actually struggled to get the company to realize the benefit of using Strove? Hmm. So I think um, we've a lot of the time we have to at least give some examples of how our product has been deployed and used successfully within a company. And fortunately, like we've been around long enough now. I mean, it's only been about two and a half years, but we've got enough success stories to show to companies and say, you know, these were the early adopters and this is like the value that we've created within their organization. Um, so you're sending some... them reports and showing them like, yeah, you so it could your... be like, yeah, like case studies or um, just general reports on, um, obviously we never reported like individual employee data, this stuff is like all aggregates and anonymized, but just wanted to make that clear um, <laughs> <laughs> um but user the, id 1344 yeah, <laughs> no, you'd be super careful with that um that's that's one thing that we that we um at least from a product perspective like we do actually have this que- a question asked of us quite a lot is like um okay i'm gonna onboard my company but like what happens if this employee is like particularly uncomfortable about them uh, about me as an employer seeing their data so yeah, we never mm-hmm. show any uh, or display any uh, individual employee data. All the stuff is like aggregated and anonymized. So, um, but in terms of like how we, at least from a sales perspective, how we like communicating our product and the value add to clients, like we we do back up uh, what we say with sort of data and customer success stories and case studies. Um, a lot of them are from our from our early adopters. Um, and that seems to be enough of a uh, what enough information for like an HR team to make an informed decision about whether or not our product is actually going to add value. So that's like the first step. And then the second step is we usually just get people onto the product to test it out for free. So we'll get like five mm-hmm. people from HR. They can test out the product. Um, we do is it often... quite easy to do that. So do you not need, is the onboarding process quite easy? You can like you know, sign up someone quite easily and say, give it a try and see how it goes. You guys yeah, yeah. Can... yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it takes us like, if a company says, okay, cool, we want to test out the product um, and I want four people from my HR team to test it out. They send us four emails, we onboard them in like a minute or two and then, you know, they get onboarding emails with onboarding guides and they, you know, these explainer videos are talking through the product, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then they can start using the, the platform. Um, so we've made that, that fairly easy. Mm. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't really be able to do it at scale. Um, mm. so, we've, so we try to make that process like fairly streamlined and simple. Yeah. I don't have a next question. <laughs> I, do. <laughs> I do. I <laughs> do. So, so Chris, um, in the newsletter this week, in our Builders Corner section, we actually mm-hmm. talk about vanity and sanity metrics. And, you know, one of the biggest pitfalls for founders is to get stuck looking at the wrong metrics thinking a company is moving when it's not so you've got quite a complex business in the sense that it's not straightforward to figure out well what is the sanity metric Mm -hmm. um i mean you can sign customers up right left right and center but but if people aren't using the product um you know it's not really testimony of of it working so what are what are some of the metrics that you guys are looking at and what gets you excited if you see a metric moving which metric gets you excited sure so we I guess from a from a sales perspective, I mean the standard is like you know MRR, so like a monthly recurring revenue. Um, that is a fairly good indication of um, uptake with the platform because we've got a um, what we call like a fair use pricing model, so we actually only charge for usage on our platform. Um, whereas like a lot of companies will, um, you know, if you onboard ten thousand employees, they'll charge for all ten thousand, even if only one percent of the company is using it. We just think that doesn't really align incentives properly. Um, so, 
so MRR from a sales perspective, from a product perspective, obviously there's the you know monthly active user counts that we look at, things like that. But I think what's almost more important is looking at stickiness and how many of those users are actually coming back every day or every week or every month um, to use the platform. Um, because we're onboarding new users all the time. So naturally our um, monthly active user counts will most likely increase. Um, but we want to see how many of the users that we've onboarded and we're using the product in let's say month one, month two, month three, as an example, are actually coming back and using the product in month four, five, and six. Um, so I'd say that's like one of the more important metrics that we look at. Um, awesome. and, 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 and is there a way, I don't know if you're currently doing this, but I'm, I'm sure this has come up in a product meeting, but is there a way to actually compare people's participation in the platform with their job performance and or performance of the company? Um, not yet, but it is something that we are going to start working on fairly soon. So one of the things that um, we'll probably start working on within the next like month or two is, so there's these HR systems that, you know, bigger companies will use to manage things like either payroll, manage employee leave, or, you know, just general employee management tools. Um, a lot of that data on that platform is actually quite interesting. So looking at things like, you know, how many employees are taking sick leave, that kind of stuff. Um, we, our plan at, you know, in the near future is to start bringing ex external data from these HR systems that are, the data is obviously very um, people specific and people focused, bringing that into our platform and then mapping that data against things like, you know, physical health data with an organization or like, you know, we screen for a whole bunch of mental health indicators. So what are the scores for each one of those mental health indicators that we're screening for? Um, and seeing if there's any correlation between like, um, you know, if there's been an improvement in uh, or an uptick in physical activity within the organization, what does that look like relative to, you know, reported, well, um, let's say sick leave taken by the company over, this, over the same period of time? And can you draw like inferences from the data? as an example. Um, so that's at a high level. Those are, those are the kind of things that we, that we'd be working on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Chris, we've got this, you install this now for a corporate and you know, mm -hmm. the guys that are used to running in the mountains and uh, the guys on the mountain bikes, they, they're super excited. They get on board. What about the people that are not really into those kind of things? Like what does the platform offer for them? How do you get them, excited on board participating i know you mentioned the mental health aspect i think that's obviously mm -hmm. important but when, when it comes to the physical side like um sure. i mean if you ask me to go run 5ks now i um i won't get too excited about that <laughs> if it comes to benefit but um what, sure. what can you offer a guy like me <laughs> sure so i think <clears throat> so i think like what we're trying to do is like we've got users on our platform that are like super active and will ride like hundreds of kilometers a week all the way through to um, users who, you know, don't have like, let's say a wearable device or don't use any kind of activity tracking app. And I only really, I'm speaking specifically on the physical whole side now, um, will only really be interested in, um, so we've got a whole bunch of like in-app workout content as an example. So kind of like yoga sessions and hit workouts, um, like mobility exercises, all that kind of stuff. It's all like video-based content. No That's fairly short form. It's like between five to... 15, maybe 20 minutes at most. Um, so if I'm not inclined to go outside and go for a run or go for a cycle or whatever, I can open up the app and engage in like a five minutes um, mobility session as an example. And we do actually reward people for doing so. Um, so you don't have to, uh, I'll get to like how that part, part of the product works in a second, but um, you don't have to necessarily be recording a run from your Fitbit device as an example into Strove and earning points in order to be able to like go and spend those points and rewards. Like if you just engage in some of our content on the app, um, you can also unlock value for yourself. Um, so sort of two parts, essentially. So that's like the one way in which someone who maybe isn't inclined to be physically active outside um, can derive benefit and sort of value from, mm -hmm. the, from the platform. And then the second piece is um, on, the, on the mental health side. Um, so we're trying to address an employee's mental health needs sort of across the spectrum across the mental health spectrum. So we've got employees with 
well, we do, we give employees access to things like mindfulness content and sleep content, so things like that. Um, we've got mental health screening service. They can use this to like sort of monitor their mental well-being across a few different mental health indicators over time. And then all the way through to, we've got like a teletherapy service on our platform as well. Um, so we've got a network of life coaches and psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, so not, not psychiatrists, just say apologies. Clinical psychologists, uh, psychologists and, um, and life coaches. And they essentially provide like these one-on-one -on -one sessions to employees. Um, so mm -hmm. you can open up the app, um, you can book a session with one of these mental health professionals, and then the session is all facilitated virtually. Um, so that's essentially like, if you're not inclined to be physically active outside of like engaging with content, there's like this whole suite of mental health features that you can mm -hmm. use to. Okay, that's awesome. And, yeah. and all rewards based. I mean, you get rewards for doing things for most things so as an example the way in which you can so essentially you earn points for doing multiple different things on the platform and then okay. those points can then be essentially used for two different things so the one is a um you can use them to redeem rewards so we've got rewards in reward partners in like 140 different countries so yeah. i mean you can redeem rewards pretty much globally in south africa oh. as an example there's like Bootleggers, feeder, I can do it. You end up with yo yo, right? Yes. Yo yo yeah. goes everywhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, so essentially, um, you can take your points and you can use them to redeem rewards. Mm. Or we've brought in like uh, essentially like a bit of an environmental player into the platform. So, you could take your points and spend them on the planting of trees and reforestation projects around the world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so it's kind of like those two options. Um, but the way in which you can earn points is sort of a variety of different ways. So you can earn points for, um, this is the way in which we've sort of gamified the platform and the way in which we're trying to sort of drive more engagements is you can either record and sync physical activity data. So run, walk, swim, cycle, steps, that kind of stuff. If you record a meditation on our app, you earn points as well. If you submit a mental health screening survey, you also earn points. Um, if you watch a piece of workout content, you also earn points. So basically we've built a whole bunch of different ways in which um, an employee can sort of create value for themselves outside of using the, that feature, mm. um, that they can create value for themselves in the platform um, and generate value for themselves, I should say. Um, and it's really just to try and make the product as inclusive as possible awesome. um, mm. yeah so so i read this book by um i'm not sure i'm pronouncing his name right but it's a guy who wrote the book hooked um near eel yeah yeah anyway he wrote a second book called indistractable and in this book mm -hmm. he speaks about um loss aversion as a tactic to habit forming right so um one of the chapters is based on this around helping people quit smoking and mm -hmm. like one group would actually pay, I don't know, five thousand uh, dollars, and if they stop smoking, they get their five thousand dollars back. The other group would say, okay, if you stop smoking, you get fifty thousand uh, dollars. And the group that would have the reward, whereas you know, almost nothing. And the, but the people that were scared of losing their five thousand dollars, they all stopped smoking. So along along with this. <laughs> Loss aversion <laughs> thinking. Have you thought about the concept of actually reversing yeah. the rewards and going, yeah. you know, no, um, it might not be that practical, but I mean, it would be funny to say, look, if you don't exercise as much, you lose off your salary. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Has, has that come up as an idea? <laughs> uh, so we, sort of, and we and I think the point of... really, Chris, is like the psychology of what you're doing. There's a lot of interesting things that can, can get people going. So, so have you explored that or whatever interesting things have you found? For sure. So, we have definitely explored it. We have a like, you call it like a micro version of that in the platform. So we've got like a, um, it was like our first app, it's like a streaks counter. So for every every time you sync an activity on a platform, there's like a little streaks counter on the top right hand side of the app. And it ticks up each day as you record an activity that's either 10 minutes or longer. So, and obviously if you don't record an activity, you go back down to zero. So that sort of loss aversion piece we've brought it into the platform to some extent. Um, we have, I've chatted to you about this like a few times. Um, we have definitely thought about ways in which we could potentially, um, you know, bring 
more features like that in. I think for us, we need to make sure that like the base level user experience is like a seamless end to end before we start because it it can introduce an element of complexity and consequently some confusion to some extent because it's like I'm mean, only points which I can spend on rewards, but then you're taking them away from me. So like where do we actually fall along this line? Mm -hmm. So um it is something that we'll look at in a bit more detail and explore in a bit more detail a little bit further down the line once I think the process is a bit more mature. Mm -hmm. Um but I think there's still like a whole bunch of stuff that we need to build in the platform before we start doing that. Is there a way to check if your users are gamifying the gamification? So they're like not doing the, the things they say that they're doing. Uh, sorry, just repeat the question. So is there a way for us to check if there's? If, if there are people that are gamifying that yeah. whole experience. So like, um, yeah, I, I meditated. Like what if they didn't? Like, is there a way yeah. to, to stop yeah. people from gamifying the system? Sure. So on the, on the, physical activity front when data is recorded from other wearables or activity tracking apps. Um, we are, we do have flags to check um, like internally for whether or not, like we had people who, you know, recorded uh, an activity on, I think it was like Strava was one of them as an example. And it was a, a run, but that person was running at like ludicrous speeds. <laughs> Like it's just not humanly possible. Um, so we do have like internal flags okay. to pick up on that kind of stuff. Um, the I spoke about like the duplication of activities. So what some people have tried to do in the past is like record activities on two different devices and then try and sync them both into okay. our platform so that they can earn double points. So we've also built like checks to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, the on like the content piece that is a little bit harder to manage but we've designed a way where the incentive isn't really big enough for someone to actually like yeah. invest a lot of time and effort into trying to cheat that part of the so, that makes sense. so at the end of the day most of the real way that points are earned and everything is with a wearable it's with something that's giving actual data to strove that for the most part yeah okay yeah okay cool yeah, sorry. So just one more thing, Chris, um, sure. you know, in uh, when I looked at your product, like something that stood out for me is like, there's almost this move to earn concept going, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if you're aware, but yeah. uh, there's a lot of Web3 startups that have tried this and mm -hmm. um, some have been grossly gamified. Um, <laughs> so Stefan being an example of such a platform. Do you yeah. see any benefit for Strove heading that direction, actually making a token uh, having it on the blockchain, making that token interchangeable, maybe even tradable on an exchange, or um, is there a specific reason you took the approach of, of making it more of a closed loop system? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, the first thing when we, or at least when we started the business was trying to figure out, like, do we build a, um, a consumer-facing a com consumer product and we go straight to the consumer, or do we build something B2B and then they offer to the employees? Um, and this was like two and a half years ago, like building a consumer focused app is incredible. It's incredibly challenging from a retention yeah. perspective. Um, expensive. Very expensive. You've got to spend so much money on marketing. The product has mm -hmm. to be like, it cannot be a single flaw in the product. Otherwise, because to try and convince people to pay for something in their own capacity mm -hmm. um, is, is far more challenging. Whereas like, we go to a really big corporate and we we sign one contract and we get 15,000 users. It's like to mm -hmm. try and get 15,000 users in a, like a direct consumer or like a B2C version of our platform. Would be, yeah, so it's way more challenging. So, mm -hmm. so I, I don't think, and it's purely just from like a, from a acquisition or retention perspective, I don't think it's anything that we would do right now because i think there's still like a ton of opportunity on the on the b2b side that being mm. said i do think um we've had a few people ask us you know they've, they've left their company to go and like do their own thing or freelance or whatever and they were previously on strove and have subsequently asked if they could stay on the platform and they have expressed mm. their willingness to pay for it and this has all kind of happened like within the last few weeks. So we are starting to think about now, well, do we need to have 
like a version of our platform that is a mm. bit more B2C that people can transition and use it onto. Yeah, build, um, build, build a little community for the startup people and then they can all yeah. smash each other at running. Yeah. And... <laughs> no, I love that. I was thinking the exact thing. That's that's a great idea. And you get yeah. you get AWS credits for, yes, for being active. <laughs> <laughs> um, Henry but... Zitman, if you're listening to this, hook us up. <laughs> such a great idea but yeah i think just to just to answer your question around like the, the token piece and the web3 piece um i think we can do a lot with like the current you know rewards structure that we have in place and the incentive structures that we have in place to drive the, the, the kind of um behavior change that that we ultimately want to see um i think to start investing in you know developing a token and putting something on the blockchain and going that route um i, I don't see the, the the investment case to that just yet maybe in like a few years they might be mm. but i think for now uh and given like what we have on our roadmap i think we've got enough that will enable us to sort of attract the right kind of user base and retain them over time so, mm. so that leads me to your roadmap and you said that you've got AI on that roadmap. So what does that kind of look like? How are you plugging mm. that and how did that get prioritized? Because, you know, AI wasn't a priority up until about six months ago. So how did mm -hmm. you guys bump it up and, and, and what yeah. is, what, what can people look forward to? So I think it's something that we have been thinking about for like the past year and a bit. It's really just been around like prioritization and figuring out what we need to be working on with sort of limited resources. Um, I think for us, we were talking about like the engagement piece earlier. Um, I think one of the ways in which you can really drive you know, a, a serious uptick in engagement, um, particularly with our kind of product, is making it a lot more personalized. Um, so the way in which we intend on doing that is um, essentially building out you know, a recommendation engine, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term. Um, and really the purpose behind that would be to so we're collecting like a whole bunch of different kinds of physical health data types, mental health data types. Um, so we can build quite a sort of comprehensive profile, health profile on a user. Um, and then we've got sort of a network of um, both mental health professionals as well as uh, physical health, uh, physical health professionals. We've got a chief medical officer on board, uh, and a trained oh, physician, cool. and we've got um you know clinical psychologists that we work with etc so really what we're going to try and do is um every day or every week or every month we sort of kind of working on figuring out like what frequency we need to be doing this in. but essentially the way in which we personalize it is like we provide these a series of recommendations to users based on certain things that they should be doing from a either physical health or mental health perspective depending on what their data looks like uh, across each one of those spectrums. So as an example, if our system um, stop, starts picking up patterns over time uh, for a particular user that they're trending negatively with respect to like their uh, burnout indicator, which is like a, a score that we um, track and measure on our platform, then there's like a few things that we could like sort of recommend to that user in any given week or in any given month. And, you know, things uh, could be things like, you know, we've noticed that there's been an uptick in your burnout scores. Um, this is like how it's compared to your burnout scores over the past three months. We would suggest that you speak to this particular professional through the teletherapy part of our platform. And then like on an interface, we would redirect the user to a specific professional that deals with uh, burnout in the workplace as an example. And they could engage in like a one-on-one -on -one session with it. That's like one example. Another may be, yeah, we could be looking at things on the physical health side, picking up patterns and trends in terms of how they're doing with direct their physical health. Um, and then we may provide them with like a series of um, recommendations on certain sort of physical health things that they could be doing um, mm. to improve their physical health over time. So that's like one example. And the other is like essentially having a, um, yeah, basically like a health coach in your pocket. Uh, so yeah. you can open up the app. It's almost got like, I don't want to use the word chat GPT because I think it's like completely overused, but like a chat GPT like interface. Mm -hmm. um, we have like a large language model running in the background and really like the purpose of it is to enable an employee to um, engage in a chat um, with our health and well-being AI 
um, and they can provide them with, you know, insights into a variety of things. So mm. they may ask things like, um, you know, I've been doing, uh, well, you could potentially ask, um, you know, how has my physical activity looked over the last period? It can maybe provide a response for that. And you could say, okay, well, based on this, how much should I be, uh, what should my macro nutrient um, intake look like? And then we could provide them with like a series of nutritional recommendations on top of that. I love well. that. I love um, that. Yeah. So really I'm curious. Providing... Sorry. sorry, go for it. No, sorry, sir. I love, the... I mean, I could continue talking about the product side of yeah. it, but I'm actually quite curious about the tech side because everyone's like, cool. you know, trying to figure out how to go the AI routes. So how mm -hmm. are you going to build in a language model, a long language models? Do you have, do you have to get a dev? Or are you going to go outsource finding people that, you know, AI developers, like what is your strategy to, to, to build this? Yeah, so fortunately, like a lot of these models are, I mean, they've been built already. All we would need to do is then just train the models. Um, okay. So we, like we basically like the thinking is just go and use like an open AI, uh, GPT-4 model equivalents, uh, train it on our data. Um, and then release, you know, something like that into our platform. Um, on the recommendation side of things, um, it'd be fairly basic to start. Um, but there's various there's various models in which, um, like machine learning models, that you can use to build out our recommendation engines. We haven't decided exactly the path that we want to take, like from like an architectural perspective. But it is something that we will um, sort of start working on within the next couple of months. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, because I think everyone, like we, especially on the show, Renia, we always talk about the opportunity that AI provides, but they, we, we never can, kind of dive into, okay, but how do you go do it? So, so mm. it's nice to get some. So like there's a lot of, um, I mean, you, there's, there's so much like off the shelf stuff that you can use these days. Like, you, I mean, a lot of the legwork is done, like mm. infrastructure stuff, like the base level models, none of that really needs to be built. Um, I guess the one thing to consider is, you know, potential cost implications, um, both now and down the line, because if you embed one of these models in your platform and it's costing you X, like if mm. you don't necessarily know what might happen to the pricing in two mm. years time. So it's like you need to put in some sort of risk mitigation strategies yeah. to make sure that that doesn't become an issue. Um, I think, I think that's where a lot of people are in for surprises, right? Because they're building and integrating and going crazy. Mm -hmm. And to a large degree, GPT-4 has, has commoditized this, you know, base mm -hmm. level of AI by making it quite accessible. But, mm -hmm. you know, as thing scales and it's successful, it can it can get quite pricey quickly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah. it's definitely something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm scared of, because I saw it with ClickUp, so I'm quite a big ClickUp fan, and that's a project mm -hmm. management tool. And I saw they made a long marketing kind of campaign about bringing AI into it. And then when they, when they launched it, it came with a price. Month and a half later, yeah, month and a half later, it's free. I've got it with my package, the, the, the basic package, it's there. If I want to use it, it's there. I'm just yeah. worried that, you know, people dive in thinking they're going to be able to charge more, but now it just becomes a value add. So yeah. I'm no, just curious like, about it. It's like avoiding. a commodity. Yeah, <laughs> avoiding it. Yeah. How do you avoid that from happening? For sure. I think like for most companies, I don't think it's something that you can charge over and above your standard like subscriptions that you would charge. I think it just needs to be um, an additional essentially free of charge value add. It's like you're adding another feature to your platform. Like you don't add like, let's take, I don't know, what's an example? Like use Notion. Uh, so we use Notion internally for a few things. Um, if Notion adds like a new feature that like enables you to nest folders within folders etc cetera, etc cetera. like they, they can't just like simply charge you well they wouldn't simply mm. just charge you for that mm. additional feature add because and it's just like not, not really how software businesses work but i think the same thing is because it's like ai is now ubiquitous like i don't think companies could just like most companies i don't think they could just like start charging more mm. for adding ai into their platform mm. if but sense. if you don't add it you might fall behind right no exactly <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> cool. Well, Renee, any last takeaways for Chris before we bid him a farewell? No, it was a lovely conversation, Chris, and uh, well done yeah, for what you you've built so far in such thank a short you. time, actually. And um, thank you. looking forward to see strength, uh, Strove go from strength to strength. Oh, thanks, mm. guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Thanks very much, Chris. Cool, guys. Thanks, everyone. Right. Bye. Okay. See you.